Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Now, confidence in the UK economy has fallen at the sharpest rate in almost 22 years after the vote to leave the European Union. And it's not the only sign of economic problems. Seven commercial property investment firms have halted trading after investors scrambled to pull out their cash. Our business correspondent, Helia Ebrahimi, has been speaking to the head of one commercial property firm. Martin Gilbert of Aberdeen Asset Management is still allowing investors to get their cash out now, but only if they'll accept a reduced amount. 800 miles from the jitters of London's stock markets, Inverness looks untroubled by Brexit's economic fallout. But the man in charge of Aberdeen Asset Management, which runs £290 billion of funds, says these are troubling times across the whole country. It's the biggest shock we've had in uh, 50 years, probably. So, so I think there is a lot of uncertainty around. Today, consumer confidence fell sharply, with people gripped about worries about rising prices, fewer jobs and sliding house values. In London, it's the property skyline that seems most vulnerable, with seven funds being suspended in a trend uncomfortably close to what we saw in the aftermath of Lehman. People are trying to draw their money out, and that's causing the funds to have to sell into a falling market, which they don't particularly want to do. Now, for the broader economy, this is just part of a general trend. So this is the uncertainty around what the UK economy will look like over the next two or three years. In the next four years, 26 million square feet of office space was supposed to be built, the equivalent of 50 more gherkins. But with many fearing a city exodus, how much of this, like the plans for the pinnacle, will really get done? And how much will fall by the wayside? As they're not building in London and the, and the market is starting to fall away, that will just radiate out from London and will eventually, you'll find that happening in Scotland as well because the confidence will, will have gone. Since Sunday, seven funds have been suspended as people rush to the door to pull their money. In total, these funds account for £25 billion, but many investors are small retail savers who have complained they didn't realise they would be barred from taking their cash out. There's a real panic, isn't there, in the market that property funds are just not worth anything anymore. Uh, well, they're worth quite a bit more than, uh, than, than nothing. And I think what we've done is, as you know, we have uh, cut the pricing to uh, what we call a, a level that if you want your money today, and we're happy to give you your money today, uh, th there's a bit of a discount to it, a bit like you trying to sell your house a in three or four days. It's three a 17% four day. gate, Martin. Yeah. That, but that's, but, but, investors are taking a hell of a shock from that. Well, I think, I think what it's trying to do is trying to calm the market. Is it fair, though? Because a lot of those investors, they're retail investors, they, they say they didn't know that this was going to happen. They thought they could access their cash immediately. Yes, and that's what we're trying to do. Uh, we're trying to allow them to access their cash. So we think it's a better option. In we one week, seven funds have had to take action. It's caused huge panic. The pound's gone down to a 31-year low. Yeah. Something's gone yeah, wrong. Yeah, well, the, the thing that's gone wrong is the EU referendum vote, which, which no one expected. Up in the Highlands, people are more sanguine about the unsettled course ahead. I think that a lot of the panic is coming from the southeast and London bubble, which is, uh, seems to be going berserk about it. don't really know what's happening, what's going to happen to the country. Does yeah. that worry you? Yes. A trade's not going to stop between Germany and us and other European countries, is it? You know, it doesn't, life doesn't stop there. The difference for Mr Gilbert is whether immediate investor shock morphs into consumers chucking everything down the pan. Now, it's not, of course, just the economy which has been immediately affected by the Brexit vote. There are now questions over the future of science funding and employment and whether Britain will still be able to attract the brightest minds in research. One Belgian scientist who helped discover the Ebola virus before relocating to the UK has told us he wouldn't have done so had we been outside the EU. Our science editor, Tom Clark, went to meet him. Spain. Portugal. Greece. Bangladesh. Spain. Cyprus. Israel. The UK. Singapore. UK. Greece. 
France. These are the faces of modern British science, young, intelligent and international. This lab at Imperial College is led by Professor Mike Levin. He won't forget the morning Britain voted to leave the EU. I walked into our uh, department and found the entire team looking like they had just been to a funeral and I think everyone was very upset and devastated. It's an EU passport and EU grant money that allowed Cypriot PhD student Stephanie Menicu to come and work here. It was already difficult for scientists to apply for grants and be successful and there were a lot of opportunities from the EU so now it will be even more difficult for, to apply for grants. Over the last decade, the lab has won 35 million euros in EU funding. It researches better diagnosis of fatal childhood infections like meningitis. They're rare diseases and access to the EU and its scientists makes the work possible. By pooling the patients, the resources, the expertise, not only from the UK, but from multiple countries in Europe, we have access to a very vast patient load that can be studied. The majority of academics argue Brexit is a threat to the high-tech knowledge economy itself. Take London's redeveloped King's Cross. Google has just moved its European HQ here. This summer, the new Francis Crick Institute opens, a world-leading centre for biomedical research. One of the big reasons the Crick Institute is here in King's Cross rather than in Cambridge or Croydon it's because it's right next to St Pancras station with non-stop links to the rest of Europe. Because if you ask pretty much any scientist, they'll tell you the EU and its people are now part of the lifeblood of British science, engineering and medicine. One third of the Crick's staff are from other EU countries. Its Nobel Prize winning boss gives a clear verdict on Brexit. In my view, it is the worst thing that's happened to British science in decades in my lifetime. Between 2007 and 2013, the UK paid 5.4 billion euros into the EU to fund research. In the same period, the UK received 8.8 .8 billion euros back. 16% of academic staff in UK universities are EU nationals, and half of PhD students are from overseas. EU money doesn't just fund basic research. It was mobilised in 2014 to develop the first vaccine against Ebola to ensure another outbreak like the one in West Africa doesn't happen again. The work was coordinated by the man who helped discover Ebola, a Belgian scientist who chose to live and work in the UK. Without the UK being a member of the EU, I would probably have gone to the US. But scientists, he argues, won't up sticks and leave provided whoever is running the country next understands how they work. But here we are, and I think now is the time to see what can we, uh, you know, make out the best out of it and making sure that um, world-class science is preserved, and that requires openness, because there are very few sectors in society that are so global. Science is a 24-hour-per-day uh, uh, type of global business. British science isn't dependent on the EU. The structure of the atom, DNA, more recently graphene, were all discovered in Britain by foreigners who weren't from Europe. But a vote to leave has most academics thinking their work and working relationships just got a whole lot harder. Well, earlier I spoke to the Cabinet Minister, Chris Grayling, who's the campaign manager for the Conservative leadership frontrunner, Theresa May. I asked him, in light of the real-term cuts in science funding, whether a government led by Mrs May would find the extra money the UK currently gets from the EU for science research. I can't give guarantees about future budgets, but what I would say very clearly is that science funding is a priority for the current government. I cannot conceive of a situation where we would not want to carry on funding science, supporting international projects, uh, subscribing to national, international collaborations when it's in our interest to do so. I don't believe the science community has anything to fear. Well, the science community has a lot to fear. I mean, we're heading for a recession. There was already a real terms cut in science funding. Without the EU money, We'd have been looking at billions of pounds less over the last seven years. But it's, it's our money in the first place. We pay so 20 that's, billion... Well, we, that suggests we pay that you're billion committing pounds a, to ring-fence that money that we currently hand over to the EU. Well, we pay £20 billion pounds a year 
to the European Union, we get about £10 billion of that back. There's £10 billion we don't see again. But the £10 billion that we get back includes science funding, it includes money for farmers, it includes money for the regions. I do not consider it even remotely likely that a future government, this government, will want to undermine the future of our scientific research. I just can't see why we would do that. It's but an it, investment in our future. If, but in the meantime, we've got months where you're consumed with a leadership election, so there's a lot of uncertainty. Do you think there's a case for just speeding up that contest a little bit? You're currently not going to have a new leader in place until September. Look, um, you can't change the rules of a game halfway through. Um, we are in a situation where we have a constitutional process. The way we elect a new leader, the way we elect a new prime minister, the one thing we can't do is shortchange that. If you decided it was all, the party board decided it was in the national interest, could that be brought forward, that September date? Uh, it could be, but I suspect it would need the consent of both candidates. You can't simply change the rules of a game halfway through. But the fate of the entire country now rests in the hands of 150,000 Conservative members. Is that right? Well, it's how political parties elect their leaders, uh, it's how we elect our leader. I would personally rather, I was very clear during the campaign, I would prefer that David Cameron hadn't resigned, but he has. We have to deal with that situation, we have to elect a new leader, and people would expect us to do it properly according to our constitution. Do you trust Andrea Leadsom? There's been some question marks over... Uh, her account of herself on her CV. Look, I, I, I know Andrea, Andrea well. I like Andrea. She's a valued colleague. What I'm arguing is the positive for Theresa May. Theresa May is the experienced, level head to deal with a challenging situation. She's got experience of negotiating international agreements, complicated and difficult ones, like the one to, uh, to, to deport Abu, Abu Qatar to, to, to Jordan. That stuff she's done already. The point about Theresa is that she can step straight into the Prime Minister's school, uh, shoes with experience, with a track record in government, I think right now that's what we need. But it's, 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 it's interesting that you're, you're not concerned about Andrea Leadsom's CV. Some people are. Do you think that's sniping? Look, I'm not into talking down colleagues. Um, we've got a great team in the Conservative Party, a great team of ministers, people who bring real strengths to the job. What we're doing, though, is electing our new Prime Minister. And my view is very straightforward. If we're electing our new Prime Minister, we need the best person for the job. And the Conservative Party this week has demonstrated that the overwhelming majority of members of Parliament think Theresa May is the best person to do that. And I hope very much our members will listen to that advice. Will they listen to someone who called them the nasty party? Oh, I think uh, the Conservative Party today is a very different party to ten years ago, and it's people like Theresa and David Cameron who have helped to turn it back into a party that's electable. You know, we won our first majority since 1992 last year. That's because the party is smarter at reaching out to a country that's changed and doing it well. Chris Grayling, thank you very much. You're welcome. I've been